John Mayer had come in on Halo 2 and Incubus and whatever Breaking Benjamin and Nile Rogers and Steve Vai. And, you know, I'd had some real amazing people who were musicians that worked with us on the music. And so he calls me and says we were thinking about who you should work with next. And so we we think you should work with Paul McCartney. And I'm like, wow, (laughs) okay. Like, that sounds amazing. You've got to be kidding me. But like, what's your connection? How how could you get Paul McCartney? And he goes, oh, well, we we can't. We just were thinking that'd be cool. (laughs) I'm like, oh. So that was Marty O'Donnell, good friend, uh, old friend. Did you even realize he's like 20 years older than us? That's nuts. <laughs> when I saw what he Marty said But Marty talking that, about like... yeah, how, how he got hooked up with Sir Paul McCartney. What a, what a fabulous story. Uh, it was great catching up with Marty the other day. When he said that, I like looked at me, you, and I was like, he looks better than both of us. He looks like he's 27. <laughs> I'm like, what? what is he eating? Is he a vampire? <laughs> He's he's, Anyways, uh, he's yeah. getting. He, uh, looks, he does not look older. I'm sure he's getting blood transfusions, you know, from like baby rabbits or something. <laughs> yeah. That's some conspiracy. So, theory so uh, <laughs> you know what showed up in the mail for me yesterday? Your shirt. I I forgot about. No, I did a I did an order on Amazon. I totally forgot about it. Um, okay. And this package shows up, and I'm like, what What is this? And I open it up, and there's ten bars of Irish Spring soap in it. Oh, you were telling me about this. You have a subscription, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I I have a rat problem. I I've I have rats have been like uh like eating literally eating my car. I took my car in for service, and the guy's like, "Well, what? you got a rat problem." Yeah, and he was telling me that they don't like the smell of Irish Spring. He was like, "Go get some Irish Spring and put it in the trunk oh, of your car." Oh, you know, I I. So I live right next to a patch of like woods, right? Like it's like a, it's called a, it's not like a big set of woods. It's just like a bunch of trees and stuff. And every time the pest guy comes, goes, they always say, that didn't sound, that didn't make sense. But every time the pest guy comes over, he <laughs> goes, that's the problem. Like the forest, because they just come out of there. They're like an army that's, anyways, I was looking online for like similar to this, like something to get rid of the problem without using poison for spiders and you could buy these little bags Mm. that you just place around and uh apparently the smell the scent is what pushes them away and like rosemary and uh we put some of those in front and the mosquitoes don't come i think it's rosemary but yeah Yeah, that's cool how many bars of soaps do you have (laughs) i gotta use any you gotta use them after you use them (laughs) (laughs) oh no have you ever smelled Irish Spring? That's some strong stuff. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's like the I mean, the I'm Armenian. Body it's probably good. Before X. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's like our it's like Armenian strength, I guess. I would say that soap. Yeah. Yeah, I used to use Irish Spring. That was our that was our family uh, soap, and it is it it's the kind of soap that you, you would think this podcast is sponsored by Irish Spring. By the way, because <laughs> we're talking about it. Yeah, we're, we're talking about it. A well, lot. you know, some of some of the when I was looking up this Irish Spring. Um, deter rats because this guy, this guy told me this and I'm like I'm gonna fact check or at least Google and uh, I got I got some of the old TV commercials and those are wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doesn't like I mean, water come out of the soap dated. or something? Uh, Does water no, come you're out? You're thinking of you're, no, you're th- you're thinking of those gushers chewing gum, you know? Or you chew the gum <laughs> yeah, those two. Like, but I remember yeah, like they would different. cut a slice of Irish Spring off and then they'd like oh, yeah. te- teleport. To that was the thing you they would always slice it off like it was like a potato yeah. or something. This morning I downloaded. Um, sorry to segue. I downloaded Hades. I'm going to be uh, playing Hades today. Oh, cool! That's nice. Yeah, I'm, I uh, I downloaded the remaster of Metroid, and I was like, you know what? I should probably play Hades too, as well on this. I was going to play it on the Switch, it looks which really is the nice. same as what you're doing, right? What are you doing? You're doing it on, on the, the Steam Deck. On the, I'm playing on the Steam Deck. Yes. The, the bigger that thing's the bigger pretty cool switch. although you know i had it sitting on the table for two days and just completely out of battery i i, I guess maybe you got to turn it off and not just put it to sleep so you're gonna play that that's a very twitchy game just so you know and it's kind of hard it's like that good hey no good... spoilers buddy no spoilers i'm not gonna spoil but it's a little <laughs> it's a little difficult 
it's not that easy, I think. I think you're trying to say maybe I can't handle it. Is that what you're yeah, trying to say? Kind me, of. My, my, old, my old person reflexes. They must have an easy mode, right? I'm not afraid of easy mode. I'm not proud. You, you were just telling me recently you got sick playing it. You were playing Counter-Strike or something. No, I don't know the original Half-Life. Half-Life 1. Oh, Half-Life. Yeah. Half-Life that's 1, count- yes. <laughs> and, and that's not a dig on Half-Life. That's like any no. any... Any Gen 1 FPS is going to make me, lightweight me, motion sick, 30 minutes or less, guaranteed yeah. or your money back. Like in between the, the, when they went from like the 2D to 3D, remember that? Like there was like a, I think Quake yeah. was the first one. That's Quake, where you Quake was like real 3D and, and like, yeah. Yeah. At, those were easier for me. The, the original ones really? that were like, because, because there's all, like when the camera moves around, like especially up and down, there's like a lot of tearing, you know, and the, the pers- perspective's oh, not yeah. accurate. I think you know, that's probably what sets me off. Yeah. I don't know if I should tell the story, but uh, what's the name of the dude that owns the company? Valve, Gabe Newell? Um, yeah. Chris told me a story because he worked on Counter-Strike and he was showing, they were showing Gabe Newell the game and he was playing the game and then halfway through the demo, he pulls the trash can out from underneath the desk. Oh no. And then throws up in it <laughs> and then turns oh, you, around and says, you know the, the pitch is, is going good. Yeah. You know the pitch is good. Wait. I don't know if that's a true story, but he told us that story. He told me and it's Patrick a good story. story. Yeah, I well, don't maybe know some, maybe like, somebody can help us fact check that story, but that yeah, sounds pretty could be good. hearsay. That sounds pretty but good. I was like, it made me respect Gabe Newell. I'm like, that's awesome. The guy powered through barfs and then like, yeah, and then signs going. it, and and yeah, it becomes like an industry changing. <laughs> that's legend, exactly. Right there. That's legend. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I was uh, taking the kids to school this morning, and I look over and Owen's playing something on his phone, and I'm like, what are you playing? And he said Plants vs. Zombies, which A was a little bit of surprise oh. that he was Wait, playing on what? PVZ. On his phone. On what? He was playing PVZ too. What do you mean on oh, what? Okay. On his iPhone. Yeah, yeah. On his iPhone. Okay. Yeah. But um, I told him that's one of my top fives. The original good game. PVZ. Yes. Yeah. It's a very good game. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've probably played that. I've probably played all the way through start to finish that game like, I don't know, half a dozen times. Yeah. It's so good. It is good. It's, it's one so, of those industry games. So balanced. It's one of those games that when it came out, everyone's like, you know, there's like the industry gets like stagnant and everyone's just copying each other. You know, like, oh, okay, we're going to make a better zombie game. We're going to make a better. And yeah. then when PVZ yeah. came out, it was like, this game doesn't exist. Yeah, so it was like, what the, what the, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, <laughs> and it's like so bizarre. Plants versus zombies. I like did not I you know? That wasn't the first tower defense game, was it? Uh, no, but it was the way it was played, I felt. That was like, yeah. it, it brought a lot of people to, because um, tower defense, there's like multiple ways to do tower defense. And this was more like lanes. Yeah. And it was kind yeah, of like. you're right. It is pretty unique man. that way. Yeah, it's it it like so so much like flavor, so much heart in yeah. it, you know. You know, yeah, it was you know, it's like when Portal came out. When Portal came out, it's a first person shooter, but they're doing like this new thing, you know, and they're telling yeah. a story. Also, like also had some story, yeah. Yeah. That's another that's another one of my top five. We gotta get both Kim Swift and George Fan on here. Let's do it. Yeah, that's a that's yeah. a you that's know, a remember, masterpiece. Yeah, I, I remember talking to somebody. It wasn't George Fan because I don't think I've ever met him. Um, but I was talking to somebody at Popcat about how that game was tested and balanced because it's one of those games where I feel like the balance is just so good. Um, oh, yeah. And I had just you assumed break it. that it was – well, I just assumed they did it, worked it out on a spreadsheet and everything. You know, it was just like power and speed and all this stuff. And it's like, nah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, thought like – Just play tested. Shooting in areas and being able to get to areas you're not supposed to get to is what I what I what I was assuming you meant. Because uh, you know you could Wait, shoot. Are you talking about PVZ or Portal? Portal, but you're talking about I was PVZ talking about now. PVZ. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they both start with P, so that's why that's why I got yeah, confused. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. Both spreadsheet games. Five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's number one then? Now I want to know. Number What's number one? one? You're like Halo. <laughs> 
no, come I, on, Alex. I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to put any of any of the games that I've worked on. on okay, that's in my own. I thing. like but, that. That's but yeah. if I was if I was gonna if I was gonna sort of rank the games that I've worked on, um, probably the game I had the most fun of hours playing was a game called Minotaur, which is yeah, hardly you mentioned played that. by anyone. In the in but, the, uh, in, the uh, in the interview, Minotaur, you yeah, you made that in your basement. Well, J- Jason made it, I think, probably in high school or something. But when we started working together, he showed it to me, like the like what he had built so far. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. And he's like, ah, whatever, you know, it's not that cool. <laughs> all um, humble, that's awesome. And it, it didn't, yeah, it didn't, it didn't do all that great. But it was like one of those games where it was just, it was so much fr- fun. You'd run around picking up all these little fan- kind of like fantasy combat items in a dungeon and then you go to attack each other and there was like a million different ways to kill each other you know it just depended on what you found you know and like magic That's items cool. and swords and stuff yeah, it was pretty cool other games on my top five ico is on there do you ever play that yes another one of those very unique games where it came out yeah it like it, it, it's one of it the had, few games that laura and i played together yeah you could that was what i was gonna say that was the the first uh, game you could play with uh, one of the first games with someone who didn't play games and they kind of understood it, you know. Yeah, it was watchable. You're not shooting you know, anything. It was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty. It's very interesting. I felt like the other one. The what's the other one they did where you climb on the the shadow of the colossus? I think Sh- it's shadow of the colossus. Also another really good one. Yeah. yeah. Very vibey. Both of those. Yeah. You know that kind of like fog and mysterious. Yeah otherworldly atmosphere yeah atmosphere atmosphere yeah how about you what's what else is on your top five? Oh, that's a good one so for me my favorite game of all time and i could say it because <laughs> it's like they killed it they sunset it uh was uh star wars uh force collection which i don't know if anybody listening to this has ever played this game oh i was... remember you talking about that game <laughs> that game back, is so back on colorado boulevard you'd every day yes. you'd be like oh my God, this game is so amazing look what they're doing it is amazing yeah, I remember yes that. it was so good and it's like the kind of game that i wish it was the first game that made me think of how people sunset games and how I think there's going to be a game that solves this um, for people that really love a game where they sunset it and players that really want to keep playing it can still keep playing it, you know, um, even yeah. if there isn't servers and stuff. Cause I, yeah, like it really broke. It's like the first game and then when it sunset, it really broke my heart. It broke my heart so much. They, they told you three months ahead of the sunset and I was so mad that I couldn't even load the game. Like I would try to load it and I would get like sad. (laughs) It was like, no. Well, you know, Uh, that's that's interesting because, um, yeah, you know, there, there's always been in in retail software sales, you know, to like package goods or whatever. There's always been a secondary market because you you manufacture, in the old days you would manufacture boxes and discs and they'd be sitting in a warehouse and like, all right, we got to move this stuff. And you'd call up a liquidator, you'd sell them for a couple bucks a piece and they'd end up in Costco or wherever. Mm -hmm. And they'd, you know, they'd find find a home, and sometimes even you'd you'd license a game to somebody else to manufacture for cheap or whatever, part of a bundle. And there was always this like secondary market and shovelware. Yeah. And these you know live server based games. There's yet to be a secondhand um, market where possibly there could be for games that still have an audience, but maybe not quite a big enough audience to warrant a triple-a studio and investing millions a year to to maintain and grow it perhaps there's a sec there's a business to be had for somebody who wants yeah there to has to be a business keep there. some of those games alive yeah yeah think about it like a server so like it's like nick at night remember you know how like nick at night shows like oh, like reruns from like 50 years ago or 60 years ago i mean they're still advertising there so maybe there's a way that like when you set up your servers you can like then move them to this like oldies server thing. And like maybe there's like, it keeps running, but there's no like new battle Old, path. You know what oldies, I'm saying? Is that what you would call it? Oldies server thing? Should we go register that URL? Oldie, yeah. Oldies <laughs> server it, thing. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> think about it. Like if you could just like, now it's a rerun. Because people spend thousands of dollars in these games, you know? It's like an investment to them. And then yeah, to just turn right. the game off. 
All right. like, some uh, clever entrepreneur who's listening, you know, wrap that up in some NFTs, call it a Web3 secondary yeah. market, and boom, you're going to get funded for $20 million in your seed round. <laughs> uh, hop on our Discord and uh, give uh, Aaron and I seats on your board, and uh, we will be in business. I'm there. I'll All wear right. a tie. Should we, get to the, should we get to the conversation with Let's Mr. It. O'Donnell? It's a good one. All right. Yes. We're, we're going we're gonna to roll. Okay, Aaron, today we have the absolute perfect and best guest for a podcast. My good friend Marty has been in this business for over 25 years, and this is his second career. He scored the game Riven, the sequel to Myst, wrote the iconic Gregorian chants that set the audio palette for Halo, and somehow, somehow convinced the most famous rocker of all time Paul McCartney to join him on his Destiny soundtrack. Let's welcome good friend and legend, Mr. Marty O'Donnell. Well, <clears throat> what's what's up? From what's one up, legend to another, Alex. That is so. That's the sweetest. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Wow. Holy mackerel. Is that me, really? All right. Well, that's just <laughs> that's just the tip of the iceberg. I that's, think. Yeah. yeah. You know, actually, you did get one thing slightly wrong. I didn't actually score Riven. I was this, I was so close. I had almost convinced Robin that I should do the score or at least help him with the score. So, so wait, wait, wait. I, I, I was the sound design, uh, you know, guy for, for Riven. So we did, we did sound design mm. for Riven and got, and we recorded the voices and did, you know, sound design and all that stuff. But, uh, when it came to the score, Robin Miller still did that. Well, had I had I known that back in the the late '90s, if I had known that, then maybe <laughs> this would have turned out so much differently. <laughs> yes, actually, I I think when I approached you guys, we were in the middle of getting the gig, and I was uh, I was sort of assuming that we were going to be scoring or at least help scoring the the thing. So we were doing sound design. And uh, I helped Robin build out his his new studio. We we had a I looked at a few keyboards with him and talked to him about upgrading from the Proteus to uh, a Yamaha VL1. <laughs> Let's see what else. And then I and then I sent him some stuff. I sent him some music that was of of sweet from his uh, Mist music. And then uh, we helped do uh, one of the pieces. And then he's decided, you know what? I think I just want to score the whole thing by myself. And he just sort of went away for two weeks at the very end of the project and came out with the score. So that was the end of that. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, well. I, I had a similar, you know, when when uh, Tunster introduced us uh, in the late 90s. Yes. Um, my first reaction was, up, up yours. I did the music for our games. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad, I'm glad he did introduce us. <laughs> You know, and it's what a, was funny is big the, only, the only thing I knew about Bungie in 96, 97, whenever that was when we got introduced, was that the guys at, at Cyan, who did Mist and Riven, would s- spend two, three hours a day completely wasting time, not working, but playing marathon uh, LAN parties. <laughs> they, 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 they land all their computers and played marathon, and they, they were all addicted to it. And I'm like, okay, so who, what are, who are these guys? Who's Marathon? What is this thing? And then uh, I was on an uh, online chat room. This was back in the day when the online chat rooms were kind of rare. Yeah, was this what, AO, AOL or something? AOL. Yeah, it probably was, actually. Yeah. And there was some kid who was like, gosh, I wish I could, could you be a game designer? I'd join Bungie because they right, they're right here in Chicago. And I'm like, wait, Chicago? They're here in Chicago. I just figured you guys were, you know, New York, L.A., something, you know. So that's I, I went online as as soon as I heard that kid say that and uh, found Tunser's name and contacted him, and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> but I didn't I didn't know you did I didn't know you did the music, so I apologize for stealing your keyboard. <laughs> You put you put it to better use for sure, oh. um, but uh, we that was when we were down in Pilsen. I'm, I'm pretty sure, right? Is that where? Oh no, yeah, did you come the, down? The yeah. Girl school. What what was what did you think? What did you think when you walked into that office? Because because all right, so you 
you're not like that much older than me, but like at the time I was in my twenties and you were, you were, you had, you were way more professional, you know, than us. And, and for those, for listeners at home, our first stop bungee office was in on the South side of the city in Pilsen up and coming neighborhood filled with <laughs> boys just out of college. So you could imagine the vibe. Um, tell, what did you think? what did you think when you walked in? Well, I had been to uh, Cyan's headquarters, which was a brand new building that was, it looked like it came straight out of Mist and Riven. They they designed it, you know, with wood and carvings and balconies <laughs> and in the middle of wow. a, a forest with big trees. It was, a, it was an unbelievable place. And I thought, well, these, you know, game developers, this is pretty cool. I like, I'm, I think I'm going to enjoy being in this industry. And Alex, I am a lot older than you. I was forty when I, pro- I when I met you. So that, just do the math. Now you know how much older. So I, I walked into the former girls' school in the South Side of Chicago and immediately smelled uh, sweat socks and sort of decaying pizza. What? Yeah. Are you are you joking about being forty? By the way, when he was twenty, no, no, there's no, no way. No. Are you I serious? Switched, <laughs> I was forty when I switched industries, uh, thinking I was too late to the game. I thought I was too late to the party. What? I, I thought you know it's it, the the it's passed me by. There's nothing I can do. There's no impact I can make. I'm too old. I've already got a career. That's inspirational. Yeah, there you go. It should be. It's inspirational, and, and I was thinking about this. You, you made a pretty big impact on me um, because oh, no. you know you you came from you know you you came from a a, uh, a business where it was all about production value. Um, so yeah. my impression of you was at first I was like oh because you know we were just we were young, super scrappy. We were we were trying to you know punch way over our weight, and. My my first thought was, oh wow, that, some of this stuff is overkill. And then my second thought was, oh, this is how a profession, this is how something that's professional and like, like, high quality is done. And that made I think a big impression, and that impacted a lot of how we attempted to and did you know scale as we you know approached putting Halo out. So that so that was very influential. You know, you, it, you it's, very it's taken, you know, 25, 26 years to finally hear a compliment from Alex. I, I just love this. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's true. I still haven't heard one either. Uh, yes, I've worked with him for 20 years. You know, no, just I, something else. Every studio, <laughs> I've been at three with him, uh-oh. and they're all the same. So you're like, are you describing what? <laughs> or, I, I learned what a slap bet was at Industrial Toys. <laughs> Uh, the slap bet. Anyway, sorry, I cut you uh, off. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I am joking. I, I, Alex and I hit it off right away. I think you know. I saw him as this like young entrepreneur, creative, cool guy, and with in, that was running this. You're absolutely right. It was a scrappy, seat of the pants kind of operation. Uh, uh, it, and it really did seem like you were punching above your weight. Um, because I remember see the sort of the the marketing PR side of Bungie, and then the reality of the studio <laughs> were like two different things. Uh, but you know, you never lost that that irreverent, scrappy quality, which I, I really, really liked. And the thing I said to Tunsa right away was, "You guys need me. The time has come." And I was speaking not just Bungie; I was just talking about the game industry in general. Is that it, the time has come for professionals, not Hollywood, because I had already sort of, as a gamer, I had seen Hollywood try to sneak into the game business a few times. They didn't sneak in. They just came in with a giant sledgehammer and, and then left after they destroyed yeah. something. Hollywood never got the game industry, but like I was always of the impression that someone like me, people like me who were doing professional work in audio, in you know, with actors, um, but that didn't have the kind of Hollywood ego that's like, I know the right way to do everything. But we're craftsmen and tradesmen and we're for professionals for years could come in and put that last bit of polish in the game business that it really wasn't there very much. That was the one yeah. thing I saw. Uh, yeah. Innovation was was rampant. There was innovation happening constantly and, and growth like that. But 
it was the polish side, the sort of professional yeah. polish on, on voice work and uh, sound design and music and mixing and just all of that thing. Um, that's what I, I was hoping I could add. So I yeah, appreciate well, that you, you did, and, and I think the type that that was that was the right timing because that was when games started becoming, you know, richer in in terms of the the the, the, the tools we had to to entertain, you know, not not just a few pixels on the screen and a few colors, but the whole suite right. of of delight for the senses. Um, <laughs> what? How did you like? What were you doing before we met? Like, cause I know, I know, I know the Flintstones jingle. Right. Yeah, love it. We are Flintstones. Classic. Yes. Yeah. No, young, strong and growing. And growing. Yes, yeah. I didn't want to sing it because I, I'm pretty sure I'd have to give you a nickel if I sung it. Yeah. No, I, I used to eat those. <laughs> they were delicious. Oh my gosh! You so, want to eat like three or four or six of them? It's like you're not candy. <laughs> I have two daughters, and that was one of the other differences at the time meeting Bungie. Is like not only did I have a girlfriend, I had been married for like 15 years and had two daughters. So, um, wait, you had a girlfriend and your wife? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so yes, so to be clear, my girlfriend was my wife, and it still is. Okay. As a matter of fact, we've been married okay. 40. Uh, 45 years, 46 years. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. I'm going to get that wrong. Congratulations. I'll correct. Yes. I think but, in the 40s, uh, we'll, you can like. We'll just edit. We'll just edit that in, <laughs> Marty. Good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that uh, meeting you guys, um, not only was it college guys e- either should have been in college or dropped out of college or were the college age or just out of college. Um, and the bungee itself seemed like a dormitory. For, uh, a dormitory. You know, not even a very good dormitory, by the way. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to sound horrible, but <laughs> yeah, you've seen it, it, people online well, have seen there was one night. There was one yeah, night. I'm, sit, I'm in the office <laughs> and and I'm working on. I don't know what it was I was working on. It was like eight o'clock at night. I'm down at Pilsen, and I'm like the yeah. only one in the office, and I hear this rustling out in the the main room you know and i come out of my office and i'm like what is what the hell and i walk around the corner and there's this garbage can and i hear this rustling and i look at it and there's a mouse in there and just trying to get Ooh. out he's like he's like jumping up so he can't get out he's just jumping up and down like, and i was like whoa man we had we had mice <laughs> yeah. at it too well at least it wasn't yeah, a rat that's, that's that's chicago i guess was it a dance studio no it had it was a former girls school it was a girl. Yeah. Okay, because Wide Load was a dance studio, and Industrial <laughs> Toys was also a dance studio. Oh, I interesting. Think. Yeah, the, there the might have been a dance that, studio at the girls' school. It could have been. It could have been. That was a very cool building, though. Like it had like actually a, like no, a it was a cool building. Top floor. Yeah, and the neighborhood wasn't really. Yeah, all it that, had a pool, all like a busted up pool in the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I met the guys at Bungie, and I think Alex had a girlfriend who became his wife, I believe. I don't think you were married yet. Yes. So, right. 96? When did you get married? Uh, no, we got married in 94. 94. Oh, you were See, married? I remember that. Yeah, we yeah. probably just got married during that, yeah. <laughs> well, we were married in 77, so it is 45 years. It's going to be 46 years coming up this year. All right. That's Thank why I was you. confused. Okay, but so you had your studio. You were you were in Chicago, and uh, yeah. before we met, and you were doing like uh, film, TV, commercial work, that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, we had been doing commercials for since '82. Um, so we were we were up on 15 years of doing TV TV work, commercials, radio commercials, campaigns, film scores. Um, and had built a few studios and had a, a nice studio in Chicago. And, you know, we're, you know, we were, we had arrived. We had done national spots and won some awards and Clio's and Addies or whatever Ooh, they're bad. called. And, uh, you know, we were professional, right? So the, what happened was uh, the bloom was off the rose, to, so to speak. I got to the point where, as a creative person, uh, all right, going all the way back to after I got my master's degree, I w- was on a film set, and I was, go- I thought I was going to be a college professor, and but I was spending the summer in '82 on a film set, and the 
director said, hey, can you do music for me? And I'm like, I don't want to prostitute my art. And uh, then he basically <laughs> offered me 500 bucks. And I'm like, yes, I will do it. So <laughs> it, it was... It was one of those deals where I guess I just didn't know what that my was price like was. your line 500. That's it. <laughs> and, 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 the, and of course, the thing is, is I had no possible way of making anything. But I had this friend, Mike Salvatore, who had built a little studio in his house. So I went to him and I said, hey, Mike, I'll split 500 bucks. Let's do this thing. So my price was actually 250. Okay. And then with taxes, it was about 133, I think, is what my actual price is. But, um, That's your breaking point. Yeah. So <laughs> so. So we get we went into business and did that and it was exciting because almost immediately music that you know I was writing and producing with Mike was on the television during a Bears game. I mean, it was just like how this is the greatest thing ever. It's like how, how can it get better? Well, that 15 years later, um I was really bored with doing these 30-second spots and and these, you know, selling hamburgers and vitamins and sugar water and whatever it was it just it stopped being creatively interesting and there was an actual moment where it was late at night we were of course crunching to get something done the client was coming in the next day and we're working on this claymation spot it was a spot with claymation cats and we were taking it very seriously and you know the one cat lifted its finger a certain way and i said you know i wanted the flute to cue that and mike's like no let's do this other thing and so we're having this heated argument about how to score the claymation cats for a kitty litter commercial <laughs> <laughs> and it really and this i'm not making this up it hit me like bam i have prostituted my art <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that, was, like, that was your 15 year arc <laughs> yeah. but you were getting more than 133 for that spot yeah, I know, hopefully. yeah I, I, can, I, know. I, I, under, I understand i understand i understand i i can understand that that uh thought there yeah so what what it was was i just didn't think i could do this the rest of my life and i started looking for something else and that that's uh, you know it wasn't long until i saw that the game industry uh, was getting to that point where I thought maybe I can, you know, do something here. And that's when I met, you know, the Riven guys. And then I met the Bungie guys. And, and actually Riven and Myth the Fallen Lords came out the exact same year, 1997. Um, and I yeah. remember being at the the Mac uh, Game Awards, whatever that was, Mac World Game Awards or whatever game of the year was Myth the Fallen Lords or Riven. That were the, the, both those games were up for Game of the Year. And I remember the, the Cyan guys didn't invite me to sit at their table, so I sat at the table with Alex, although I would have chosen Alex's table anyway. <laughs> well, what was fun is that uh, Myth won. Myth, Myth won. So it was like, we won okay, that. this is good. Right on. Yeah. You don't remember Alex. Awesome. You don't remember that? It was a, it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> here, Here's a. I'm curious, Marty. So you, so you call up your buddy Mike, and you're like, "Hey, yeah. help me with this thing. I'll split it." And you go into business. Your studio was called ODS, right? O'Donnell Salvatore. O'Donnell Salvatore. Yeah. How did you guys decide it was O'Donnell Salvatore, not Salvatore O'Donnell? Well, of course, I was pushing for O'Donnell Salvatore. And Mike was like, well, why isn't it Salvatore O'Donnell? And I'm like, because think about it. Number one, alphabetical order, just number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, Salvatorio. That's the way that sounds, Salvatore O'Donnell. It's like no one's going to – but O'Donnell, that has a nice ending, and then Salvatore. So the two consonants huh. in a row. I, I was always able to argue Mike that way. Like I would come up <laughs> with something, and he was just like, okay. So that's <laughs> – I, I essentially I bullied him into it. That's the truth. But it, it made sense. There no. we go. <laughs> you, you 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 do make a good argument. Is, 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 does ODST have anything to do with that? Yes, I just said we should call it ODST because of O'Donnell Salvatore. No, that's no, my favorite no, soundtrack. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, I that was like, dude, I, that's my favorite soundtrack. By the way, if oh, I could nerd out a well, bit. thank you. That's it's actually that's my I, I love favorite that one. one. Too. Yeah. yeah, the whole the whole jazzy vibe and everything that was cool. Yeah, yeah that's a, a, I have a super soft spot in my heart for that <laughs> whole game. Yeah. So, what was it like working with Paul McCart Sir Paul McCartney? How did that happen? Sir, Sir Paul. right. 
How did that happen? Well, uh, yeah. How did that happen? Does he carry okay. a sword too? Like, I don't think it's that kind of sir, is it? So we had finished the ten years of Halo. We'd shipped Reach, 2010, and like six months later, um, a guy named Lev Chapelsky, who was our sort of Hollywood agent uh, counterpart, counterpart to the other agents in Hollywood. So we needed our own Hollywood slime to go after the rest of the Hollywood slime. So that oh, was Lev, Lev is not that is not slime. <laughs> <laughs> No, but he can fight slime with whatever he speaks that language. Powers he has. Oh, he's your yeah. ogre. Yeah. So I anyway, Lev is a good friend. I love him to death, and he he got us all the actors we got um, out of Hollywood, like Keith David and Ron Perlman and Nathan Fillion and blah blah blah, all those people. How how was that whole crew? How were they? How was that crew that like those when you got famous people in the booth? How how was it work? Were you doing the voice direction? Were you going down there doing that? How were they to work with? Was anybody challenging? Uh, they actually were pitching Microsoft on, hey, we're, we you cast voices for a lot of animation. Um, we'd like to do it in the game business. And I heard that they were coming to Microsoft to talk about this stuff. And I reached out to them and I said, when you're done talking to the Microsoft suits, and it's a complete failure. Meet me in the cafeteria because I'm the one you should be talking to. And I'm not kidding. He'll he'll tell you that story because I knew that Microsoft would never understand whatever they were trying to pitch. Wait, who is this? This, this is Lev Chappelle. Lev. Oh, I've never met this guy. Okay. Okay. And sure, sure enough, that's how that happened. And and we ended up hiring Blind Light to do all the voice for Halo Two, Three, ODST, and Reach, and Destiny, and. You know they they've they've done so many game in terms of contracting voice talent and actors and stuff. It's it's unbelievable. Um, yeah, what does it have to do with Paul McCartney? Well, um, after we had had this decade long relationship with Lev, he called me uh, after Reach had shipped in 2011 ish, maybe no, yeah, it might have been, or, yeah, and he said, "Hey, Marty." We were sitting around thinking, like, who you should work with next. And so I had worked with John Mayer, had come in on Halo 2 and Incubus and whatever, Breaking Benjamin and Nile Rogers and Steve Vai. And, you know, I'd had some real amazing people who were musicians that worked with us on the music. And so he calls me and says, we were thinking about who you should work with next. And so we, we think you should work with Paul McCartney. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> okay, <laughs> like that sounds amazing. You've got to be kidding me. But like, what's your connection? How, how could you get Paul McCartney? And he goes, oh, well, we we can't. We just were thinking that it'd be cool. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> dude. Thanks, yeah. And so I said, he says, no, we really want to go see if we can make this happen. And I'm like, sure, go ahead, like knock yourself out i mean to me it was just like that's insane it's just that's just insanity um so uh, fast forward just like a couple of months i was doing a keynote at gdc and i'm being introduced in front of the it was a pretty big audience it was a combined it was i think it was game design believe it or not alex i was doing the keynote for game design and music i don't know why <laughs> but there it was <laughs> And I was being introduced to the audience, and Lev comes up to the stage as the guy behind me is introducing me, and I'm about to get up and do my spiel. And Lev goes, Marty, I, I got a meeting. Well, let's talk. And I said, you got a meeting what? Well, with Paul McCartney. And then, and now, Marty O'Donnell to give the keynote, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and the, 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 so you didn't do the, the keynote. The, <laughs> <laughs> so clearly and, the keynote was not delivered. Uh, no, I, you know, it was weird. I, you know, my, my head was vibrating. I was in some sort of weird trance and like, I'm trying to focus, but I'm like, did he just say what I thought he said? So yeah, sure enough. Afterwards, he said, I got a meeting. It's going to be a 20 minute meeting at our office. Uh, it's it's a month from now. So I flew back to, to Los Angeles um, to have this meeting. And 
you know, walk in. I had set up a, you know, I'd set my little PowerPoint up and we had a little, I was going to present what it's like to do music on games. You know, I want to be able to ask any question Paul has. I got 20 minutes, end of the day. And the days get longer and longer and weird things are happening. Like he's asked for toasted bagels with cream cheese and a pot of tea when he gets there. So I remember uh, the woman who was the assistant, Poppy was her name. She was from Australia. Uh, Poppy was assisting Lev, and she had gone out, and they got a toaster, and they had toasted the, you know, English mu- or the uh, bagel and gotten cream cheese. But had the whole thing ready to go. But I thought, you know what? This is not going to happen. This is, this is insane. But at least I can tell people that at some point in my life I was officially going to have a meeting with Paul McCartney. And then, of course, he cancels <laughs> at the last minute. But that was good enough for me. And no, he shows up. What happened to the he bagels? He, oh, yeah. oh no. <laughs> he, he, but I, what I'm saying is my my mental attitude was it was good enough. If he, oh, okay, if okay. He I happen. see. I thought you said he didn't show yes. up. It's like, well, who ate well, the bagels? I was, the bagels? I was so ready for, for that. It wasn't even going to be a disappointment because I'm like, there's no way that Paul McCartney is going to show up to a meeting. You know, it just didn't seem possible. And he comes he in and he goes, up. here I am. He just sort of walks in the door and like, it's me. And, uh, and it's like, yeah, it is you, right? It's like, for me especially, um, me growing up, uh, I was the perfect age to be, you know, a, a total fan of the Beatles. Um uh, especially because when I was in fourth grade, they were on Ed Sullivan. And the next day, like all the girls were in love with Paul McCartney and the Beatles and or John or George or Ringo, whatever. And I realized whatever chance I had with girls probably had something to do with being in a rock band, looking like Paul McCartney. You know, it, it's just like it changed everything. Like that was the thing. Uh, so to finally meet him, like you know, I had studied his music, and I, I you guys, pro- I don't know if you've heard the story, but I basically used as a template um, yesterday for the Halo theme. I don't know if I ever told you this, Alex, mm-mm, mm-mm. but I had to come up with a hooky monk. Ch- I, I wanted to do a monk chant for Halo, and I knew it needed to be hooky, so. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it in Dorian mode, but I need a hook, a hooky melody. This is the way I approached all the jingles. It's like this has to be like a jingle that could stick in people's heads, represent this one product, and we can use it forever, which was like maybe two years at the time. I thought well, maybe this will last for a year or two. So I was like, okay, what's a good hooky melody? Yesterday. Yesterday. Da, 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 da. Okay, now a Dorian melody. Da, 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 Now, well, look at it's this. not the same, but it's yeah. just, it has the f- has the shape. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Like a style. Did, yeah, and did, and was yeah. this your opener with Sir Paul McCartney when you finally <laughs> met him? Is I had how never, you I'd never told Sir Paul that I basically. Maybe he'll listen to the podcast. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know that's okay with me. Uh, what, what it was was like there were four phrases in yesterday, four phrases in the the Halo theme. There was one high point, one low point. You know that's that's had the right had that same shape. I thought if it could have that sort of lasting hook earworm quality, then you know maybe it'll maybe it'll. That work. is super cool. And that, so really meeting him like yeah. 15, 20 years later, uh, actually meeting Paul, yeah, it yeah. was, it was unbelievable. Actually, it was only, yeah, it was only like ten years later. Now that I think about it, it was twenty eleven, so it was ten years. And so, and so, you well, have this did, meeting. We did Halo and... in ninety nine. We did that first theme in ninety nine. So yeah, twelve years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you have this meeting, and then. Um... So I'm showing him everything. I'm showing him music. He, we're talking about stuff. And then he asked me about other things. And I said, well, I have this idea that I'm going to do called Music of the Spheres, but it's kind of it's kind of a crazy idea. And it's, you know, and he goes, oh, yeah, you know, that's the way it came up. For, I did Sgt. Pepper's Heart, Lonely Heart Club Band, and I, you know, just wrote that name on a napkin and showed it to the guys, you know, and they said, oh, that's cool. And so... Sorry, that's my. I, that's my, um, I, I got it. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I, yeah. I, thought, he, I thought he was here. I thought he yeah, was here. I was like, 
<laughs> Whoa. He is Paul McCartney. Yes. So anyway, <laughs> like almost two hours into this 20-minute meeting, uh, I'm realizing – the, I think this is going pretty good. Like, you know, this is, this is pretty good for a first date. And sure enough, you know, he gets up at the end, gives me a big hug. And, you know, we talked about kids and he told me about his grandkids. And it was just a really nice, nice time. Talked about music, talked about a lot of stuff. And uh, I thought, I think he's, I think he might want to do this. And sure enough, you know, a couple of weeks later, I heard through the, you know, his people that he was already working on stuff. Like he he got really inspired and wanted to do things. Wow, and so that is so cool. It yeah, is. we worked together That's for cool. almost two years. Yeah, twenty eleven and twenty twelve. Yeah, wow. Two, wow. Two, two, I mean, it wasn't solid two years. It was like Not enough. have a meeting in you know a rehearsal space in Los Angeles, and then come down to Capitol Records, and I met him there, and then you know, you know, a couple of things like that. I met him at, at Abbey Road before the final recording. And then uh, we did a session in New York, and then we did a final session at Abbey Road. It was amazing. It was a. It was that is so cool. Really, you know, was it pinnacle. mostly write, writing music, or was there ever a moment where the two of you were like, "He's got his bass out, you're on the keys, and you're in a room, and you're just kind of riffing <laughs> together"? Did that ever happen? Um, That's what it I imagine. was almost. <laughs> yes, it was, it was almost that. You know, he's a he is a keyboard player. He's he's a good keyboard player. He's a good guitar player. He's a good drummer. He's a good uh, bass player, of course. Uh, but yeah, he we we he when I met him, probably six months before the final session, um, I was at Abbey Road. Was at the Penthouse Studios, and there was a uh, keyboard there, and so he went to the keyboard and would play a little something and then he had a cd with something he had done and he played that and then i would sit at the keyboard and play him a bunch of stuff and then show him how i incorporated some of his stuff into it and that's how we worked we didn't actually we were never actually kind of jamming together which would have been <laughs> pretty intimidating i would have been just like i don't know what but the, I got, the thing I is, miss, is i gotta miss a few notes on purpose just to like oh yeah <laughs> to like yeah. make him look up. bad yeah uh <laughs> Yes, which reminds me of the story of when Justin Timberlake actually came into the studio what? during, I think it was around Halo 2 time, uh, because we had all sorts of fans in the, you know, who were popular people uh, who wanted to visit Bungie because they were big Halo fans. And Justin came in, he, he sat at the keyboard and my keyboard, and he started playing a little something. And he, his thumbs were dangling below the keys. So he was playing with like his three middle fingers there, you know. And I was standing there and I'm like, oh, self-taught, huh? So, <laughs> And uh, he actually cracked up. He knew I was joking. But I, I, I said, you know, if you want to, you know, make something for yourself, you want some lessons, I'd be happy to. <laughs> um, but no, I did Amazing. not pull. I could pull that with Justin because he's a lot younger than I am. But I, I wasn't going to do anything like that with with Sir Paul. That was no. I good, was in good, awe. Good move. He'd probably have you killed. Good move. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, were you? Did you say you were in a band in high school? Oh yeah. What was the name of the band? Oh well, we were. I was in a band called the Royal Coachman. That's cool. Because <laughs> nice. Because it sounded sort of like. It was had a British I, feel I, to it. I yeah. was in a high school band. Our band was called Rites of Passage. Rites of pa oh, see, that's a much better. How name. did you I spell like... rites? R I T E S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with the backwards R or something to be edgy. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of band Skulls was it? What, what, what kind of <laughs> what kind of music were you doing? We did we did like Billy Idol covers and stuff like that. Oh, well, that was eighties. That's it was 80s, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I was what on the was, you know. You were on the keys, yeah. Yeah. See, you never told me uh, when I went to to Bungie the first time. That whole time we worked, I didn't know that you had done the music for <laughs> for the marathon series, and people love so, that. He never stops talking about it. It's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> like he has it on. If you visit yeah. his house, he just has it on. <laughs> he just has it on all the, time. Yeah, all the time. Well, you know, there's one yeah, piece. I, I taught Alexa that, how to play it. We we had done a. <laughs> A, a sim we had done a, I had done a simple piece for some TV commercial years ago, um, I think in like 1983. And then 
we brought it back again for Kemper Insurance and did another version of it. And then years later, it's I, I did it for some little marketing thing we did for a Halo 2 something or other. And then I, I, I'm, I expanded it a little bit more and actually used it in Halo 2. And that's the piece that people go, oh, you, that's Alex Thorpian wrote that piece. And it's some piece, I don't know what it is, but it's, there's a progression that is the same progression. But, of course, I can show you that I had written it in 83. So <laughs> if anybody stole it, it would have been you. But it's one of those progressions that's sort of a, just a really common progression. But it's like, yeah, it actually, if I had known that that piece was in uh, Marathon, I would have been more purposeful in sort of rearranging it because it was close. So people yeah. are, there's still people who are absolutely convinced that the – Oh boy! Somebody on the podcast <laughs> in the thread below here will say, "Yes, it's this piece." So it's obvious that he copied it, and blah blah blah. Yeah, pretty much. You know, put them side by side, and yeah, <laughs> same exact thing. So what are you what are you doing now, Marty? Going to do what I want to do and spend time down here with my grandsons and my two daughters who also live in Las Vegas. So. I'm spending That's a lot awesome. of time with them, and then I have a home recording studio, and I'm doing music that I want to write. I'm actually working on a. I know this is going to sound weird, but I'm working on a uh, a mass. I'm going to do an acapella. I'm working on an acapella requiem mass. I've done ah, the Kyrie. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. A mass like Exciting. Catholic mass. Catholic mass, Orthodox. Just a good old. The, it's not like uh, composers haven't done this already. This is not an original thought. This is so. <laughs> I think even Mozart is, are did. There, it. Are there? What what defines a, a? What makes a piece of music a mass? Like what what is? Oh, it's it's there is a, it's a liturgy, right? There is an order of service, and there are um, t- moments in the mass that are not spoken but are usually sung, like the Gloria and the Alleluia and the Kyrie. Oh, and, that's cool. And, and all that. And so composers, you know, even, you know, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, they've all done some, something to the, for the mass. Yeah. And uh, I've sort of, in my old age here, I've kind of taken a, a return to the church and I'm very interested in the music of the church and the liturgy and... So that's why I'm doing that. That's cool. And I might do a Christmas awesome. album. A Christmas album. <laughs> hey, what, what do you think about all the? Because so so that's that's more Catholic. Are you using like organs and and things like this? No, or? no. Uh, the my vision for this is pure um, a cappella choir. So it's just voices. There's no oh, cool. instrumental okay. accompaniment. Which there's there's not a lot of that in the liturgy. There's a lot of masses that are orchestral. Or, you know, have choir and orchestra, or choir and organ. Uh, I'm doing it without instrumental accompaniment. So it's just singing. It, it's sort of, it might even just be my sense of guilt for taking what sounds like a Gregorian chant medieval church <laughs> melody, which, like I already said, it, it's, it's half Gregorian chant and half Paul McCartney. Um, it's gonna be Paul McCartney again. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> gonna do another one. I feel slightly guilty for like yeah. injecting, uh-huh. you know, high so you're, church. You're, music ato- you're atoning. Games. I'm yeah. atoning. That's Dude, what I'm doing. Those are really go. great. My my uh, my mother in law <laughs> is in the uh, and she. I don't think she is anymore, but she was in the Hamburg official choir. So I oh, got to wow. see a bunch of like all the time. The symphony we'd go watch or just choir and uh, wait Hamburg like in Germany. In Germany, yeah. okay. So we'd go all the time to go. It, it's awesome. Like at first, I was like, "What? We're gonna go to the choir?" And so no, wait, what? Yeah, you're from you're from Germany? No, my wife's German. I actually, I was working with oh, Alex before. Your mother-in-law, okay. Yeah, so we moved to Germany, and then we got invited all the time. And when you're there, it sounds amazing. It's like, oh what? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I really mean, cool. this is the thing. Uh, it, I hate to. Ad- admit this but like the the world of music of course is huge it's broad it's, it's so much that happens in music but in the video game music in the, the mid 90s it wasn't super broad so it wasn't hard to come in as someone who had some 
musical, just general musical background, and like, yeah, I think I'm going to use cello for Myth of Fallen Lords. And it was like, oh, dude, that cello rocks. Um, <laughs> And that was not Alex or Jason who said that. That was a guy named Jason Regeer. You remember Jason Regeer, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh he, yeah, he, he's he's, uh, he's he's big time at Blizzard. Oh, he's Mr. big time Regeer. Blizzard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm making fun of his. He didn't say it exactly that way, but he did say, "Marty, that cello rocks." And I thought, well, good. That's better than that cello sucks. So that was I, I felt <laughs> my, good about that. My recollection was that he was pretty musical. I, is that right? I think was he, he was. Was he a yeah, musician? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember exactly what he played, but he, he had good I, – I felt he had good taste, so I felt very <laughs> affirmed by that statement. And But what was nice is that I knew that a lot of kids who were playing video games probably hadn't heard a lot of symphonic music or a cappella choir or Gregorian chant monks or it, – it's just like it's going to be easy to bring in – you know, a, a wider experience of music into this sort of narrow field of video games. Yeah. Uh, and now, of course, there's Dude, it was everything. awesome. Yeah, we, yeah, but that era was so cool. That was like, we were, remember the magazine ads for the games? Like, they were always like super edgy. Everything was edgy. Yeah. Like, it was like, your eyes are popping out of your head. It's like all Metallica and like, yeah. And then it like, there was like a renaissance period of like this... Yeah. Halo 2 had really, okay. like, I, I feel like that one really took it to the, yeah, like really went, well, I mean, pushed it, the it, envelope. I, yeah, I, the even using, well, I mean, Alex, you probably remember the the opportunity to do, uh, introduce Halo to the world at Macworld 99. Like, I'd oh, love yeah. to hear, like... Alex, you tell your side of this story, and then I'll tell my version and see. <laughs> which, you can which see it on YouTube. Nice part where yeah. you, where you on handed YouTube. the CD to Jason, and he dropped it in, on the middle of Ontario <laughs> Avenue. Yes. And you're like, you know, oh, don't I, worry, I got a backup. I got a backup. <laughs> I still have your, uh, I still have a recording of your uh, voice message that you left me that day. Um, oh my uh, gosh, hey Marty, why... Alex. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we kind of busted the CD. Is there, I don't know if there's anything you can do, but like what? you're gonna have to fly it out tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what happened? I thought y'all were just messing around. You dropped the CD. No, no, no. no. So, so, so we, we like we did the big unveil of of Halo was with Steve Jobs on stage yeah. at, in one so of on his YouTube. keynotes at MacWorld. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, you know we had we put together this the the demo and uh, I, Marty I think you probably touched it last because you were putting the audio on it and the DVD was it a DVD CD or a DVD it was probably a CD so, back then right um, you know, like QuickTime movie a, on a CD no 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 it wasn't even, wow Alex Alex you come on that was like thirty years ago <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, a actual live uh, scripted, but it was a live demo that all Jason oh, had okay. to do was so hit the script bar the build, on a Mac. The build, right? Okay. So the, you so guys it was like had a the self-running build. build. Yeah. Yes, and there was, but sound wasn't working because we had, we had been developing everything on the PC, and with the you know, idea that it would port, you know, at some point to the Mac, and then OpenGL came out, and this is why I think it was Pete Tampty that got the. The, that moment so Steve Jobs could show it to the world and Pete so I'm sure Tampty sold it to Steve like oh this is perfect it's gonna it works great on a Mac and I think you guys had to scramble to get it to work on OpenGL and on the Mac I don't think you had more than a week to make that work if I remember correctly uh, you, you, you never have but there was no sound to, there was we had no things, sound yeah. engine so I couldn't do sound effects which were already well along at that stage and I couldn't put music on it. So it was just like, let's do music for the demo that will play at the same time Jason, the, the demo plays. so E3. <laughs> That's like, yeah, I mean, every it was, E3 demo is like so bootleg like that. <laughs> this was just complete, you know, just by the skin of our teeth, we get this thing done. And so I, we had the weekend to do the music. And I had gone to Alex, so I'm, I'm going to tell my side of the story that... I'd gone to Alex and said, "Look, this is a great opportunity. Let's let's blow the the doors open here. Let's let's do like orchestra and choir and the whole thing." We finished it on a Monday 
mid-afternoon. You guys were flying out late afternoon, and I hadn't slept most of the weekend. So I got the CD into your hands. The, this was back in the day when actually burning CDs like took time. And I was having the studio burn the second CD as as I had gone to Bungie to give you guys the CD and and play it for you for Jason and Joe, and then you guys got into the car, went to O'Hare and flew away, and then I went home and slept. And then when I woke up, like at six six thirty that night, I had this message on my machine from you saying, uh, "Yes, we sort of busted the CD." It's like, do you have another one, or it's probably too late? I mean, it was just I was just like mortified. Mike had taken the other CD, so I called him. He was on his on his way going to, to dinner. We met in a parking lot someplace, literally with him handing the CD out of his car window into my car window. And then I sped off to FedEx at, at uh, O'Hare to get it to you guys because you needed to have it by Tuesday morning because that yeah, was when the yeah. dress rehearsal was. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah. And the rest is history, I, so to speak. Yeah, but, uh, I, 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 re I remember a good portion of all that, but not all of it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. But yeah, I'm going to totally bring this up if I ever screw anything up, dude. <laughs> well, at least it's not a CD. <laughs> Halo, yeah. <laughs> Steve Jobs, yeah. -uh. But you are con you're confirming that Jason is the one who stepped on it and broke it. Is that true? Jason definitely broke it, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Unbelievable. He's throwing someone under the bus. Absolutely. <laughs> Alex put it in his back pocket and sat on it. Yeah, that's what happened. It worked out. It worked out. It all worked, it worked out. out. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> no, I remember that Wednesday. So, so the dress rehearsals was on a Tuesday, and you guys told me that it went pretty good. Uh, and Steve Jobs liked it. And so then that Wednesday was the live Macworld thing, and that show happened. And I was watching a live stream of it in my little home studio on my computer. And I remember back then, a live stream, 1999. <laughs> it's like a you tiny know, it was little... The, the little <laughs> yeah. tiny frame, you know, like real skippy, and like the music, yep. the sound was horrible. But I just remember sitting there, I... I it was a thrill to watch that thing happen and hear the crowd response and everything yep. else. And then I went down to Bungie later that afternoon. You guys were still in New York, but the rest of the Bungie crew was there. And, and uh, we were invited over to Apple something, some sort of Apple office on Michigan Avenue. And they had a big high def uh, version of the whole show. And we all got to sit there and watch it. So that was really, really? cool. I didn't know that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I do remember yeah, I the I, I do I remember that rehearsal and I remember Steve Jobs giving Jason some pointers on the ba basically I think we had like a little bit of a spiel before playing it and just simplifying yeah. it down to hey this is this is real and this is running check it out you know that that was right and let the software do the talking and that was good yeah. advice I think it it worked out pretty good so you've worked on some some um, it is, yeah. You've worked on some other games besides Halo. Yeah, uh, a biggie called Subterracore. Nope. <laughs> I've heard of it. I see. Aaron, you just did like what my I, dog did. Yeah, you just, I've never heard of Subterracore. What is that? Little... Where did that land in the timeline? Uh, that actually landed almost exactly the same time. We were working on that just after Riven and Myth 2. Oh, yeah. Soul Blighter, and oh. when we were started working on Halo, we were also working on a game called Subterracore, which was see. actually a very cool game. It had more dialogue in it than any RPG up to that point, and possibly even since. One of the goals was it was it was in the style of a Japanese RPG, which I've I've okay. heard recently it's like some sort of bad term, but it I I never think of it as a bad thing. I. My Anime. gosh, Final Fantasy is spectacular, so how could that be a bad thing? I think of JRPG as representing, you know, an RPG that has set characters, not characters you make, and turn-based. And there's just certain things that I think JRPGs is sort of shorthand for. That's the way I look at it, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, this was an American company from Viacom. Do you remember Viacom, Alex? Yeah, at Viacom's yeah, yeah. Viacom. uh, game studio. Was they now? They they Viacom's game studio was in was near Chicago, wasn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. That's why I got the gig. It was yeah. close to home again. Yeah, I, I just looked up a picture of it, and I remember the guy, the the character with the blue hair. Yeah, yeah. And well, it wasn't you, a guy. It was a girl. But... Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, Alex will cut home. that part out. <laughs> no. Why do that? I, I have I a mean, question it's... about Riven, actually. Sure. Did your... So we we talked to someone recently, and we, we realized that Riven was five CDs. Yes. And the first game was one CD. Was it five CDs because of video and sound, or just video? Was it sound as well? That, that caused now, the game to multiply by five you know, CDs? Riven was the first uh, game I was able to convince them to not do 8-bit mono. I said, look, this whole thing is like going to be, be a long answer for, yeah, it was no, the sound. No, it, 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 gonna, it needs to be stereo. And, you know, I just couldn't, I, I thought, when I found out that all these games were 8-bit mono, I was just like, okay, well, it's not, I can't do this yet. It just, I can't be in this business. Yeah. Because it was just too depressing to do something big and good and then have it become 8-bit mono. It just was horrible. Have, so, it, have it play through an analog telephone, basically. Yeah. Yes. Um <laughs> So I, there was new technology. out. MP3 was starting almost exactly at the same ta- time as ADPCM. So if you guys know what ADPCM compression is, it allowed you to do 16-bit stereo uh, that was compressed at – it was basically the same footprint as 8-bit mono, but it was 16-bit stereo. And I was like, we have to do that. And um, – that's how we did, you know, Myth of Fallen Lords and uh, Riven and all the games after that were all ADPCM compression. And the Xbox, by the way, in 2001 shipped with ADPCM compression. So everything was 16-bit stereo. Um, so uh, once again, I, I look back on that and I'm like, yeah, I got in at the perfect time technologically because – I just I couldn't produce 8-bit mono. I just couldn't do it. So it, ADPCM compression was brand new, and it just changed the fidelity. Everybody's ex- The player's experience was so much better. But no, that's not what caused Riven to be 5 CDs. What caused Riven to be 5 CDs, this is a little-known fact, was the, the idea that wherever you were, you could go any other place. So they had to, and I'm sure there could have been more intelligent or not intelligent, maybe just smarter programmatic ways of organizing (laughs) the data. I don't know. But they just, those CDs had massive amounts of copies of stuff on them so that no matter which CD was in the drive, you wouldn't have to change CDs. Mm. You could go from one place to another. So there was a lot of stuff that was duplicated on the CDs. Interesting. Um, oh, I thought it yeah. was just like the video. You know, that, it's funny because that there was, actually... There was a lot of video and that did take up a lot of space. But like, because you had, you know, if you were on on the fifth island or whatever it was and you wanted to teleport back to the first, they didn't want you to have to, to swap uh, CDs. But you still ended up swapping CDs sometimes, but mm-hmm. there was a lot less because of how they organize the data. Hmm. You should ask Rand. Rand Miller would remember that well, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> I remember that being a positive for the game, too, because it was like, you get five CDs. What? <laughs> yeah. And then it was like a plus, and then over time it was like, oh, no, it's five CDs. Like, you know, it started to become a negative. But well, just, it, by 1999, uh, they released the uh, DVD. It was the very first DVD uh yeah. Just like the first CD was missed, and the first DVD was Riven. In the so in '99, it was one DVD, and you never had to swap a disc for anything. You could just play through Riven. Yeah. So, what is and now DVD? you can play through Riven on your phone. I mean, it's just yeah, like it's no, just I'm a, sure. Yeah, yeah we're, it's amazing. Just like that was so cutting edge. You know, missed <laughs> when it came out, and oh, yeah. CD is like. What six hundred and fifty megabytes? I mean, it's like yep. that's a tiny download right now. You know, <laughs> crazy. Well, Alex, Alex, you had what? Did you you still? I mean, I see it behind you. That's not even a, an SE behind you, is it? Is that just no? A, that is that the that's first my original? Mac? That's my first five twelve. That was a one. Is that, it was a one twenty eight K Mac that we upgraded to the five twelve the five twelve. 
It's got the um, the single floppy. It's deal. got the signatures inside the inside the case. Yeah. Oh wow! Nice. It's one of those really... those first gen. My old SEs that I still have. I, I'm sort of like you. I like to keep these old things. I never had the 512 or the 128 Mac. But the plastic has gotten really yellow. Have you like? Do you have some way of making it look better, or what are you doing? Somebody told me that. Uh, oh shoot! What is it you rub on it? There's something simple you can rub on there, like hydrogen oh. peroxide or something. But um, mm. but don't try hydrogen peroxide because that's that's it's something <laughs> like that. <laughs> you just I'm not sure it's exactly computer. that. But yes. there's something you just rub it on there, and it like it cleans it right oh, oh yeah one of our engineers was telling me this because he was saying that's kind of restoring weird. some old control bradley clemenson was telling me this aaron you know, oh bradley. um yeah, but uh you know consoles. my recollection is it was always that color like the, the original 512 was a little yellow yeah. the se's were white you know the plastic the was plastic. yeah they were white and they 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 yeah they didn't stand up well i still i don't know that can't be good yeah. though. my plastic that sweats toxic chemicals <laughs> no, it can't be good. None of this stuff is good, Aaron. We don't need any of this technology. It's not good. Well, when you yeah. did, uh, uh, well, I'm not even going to ask you what you did NOP on, but you, you did you do NOP on a uh, on a on a? It was Mac? a. It was an SE. Yeah, an SE. That was. It like, was an SE. The, okay. Uh, Apparition Desert Storm. I had an SE, and then I had I had a. Uh, what, what was it? So what you were that? doing Mac, one? Mac games from the beginning. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had the uh, the that little device you could clip onto the floppy drive and stack like twenty in there. And oh no, I didn't so, even like, know about that. It was like a disc duplicator thing. So like it, you'd start a disc copy, it would spit the disc out, and then your little device would like in- it had batteries. It would like insert the next diskette into the machine, and then it would copy wow. another one. And you just let it run overnight, and it would like you'd get like fifty copies of your disc the next day. That was our that's manufacturing that's facility. Sold. That's your manufacturing yeah. facility to sell your. That first was a, game. like uh, the first few games. Uh, Minotaur was that way. Jason and I were in the basement. With Jason the, uh, was shrink wrap the machine. plastic bag. Yeah, yeah. Dude, that's shrink awesome. Wrap. I didn't know that. You never told me that story. Oh yeah. Look at that. Thanks, yeah. Marty. And there's another part of the story, Aaron, that you don't know. But Alex uh, oh. interned at Microsoft. And pilfered mm. many three quarter, no. three and a half no. inch floppy. That's, that's, that's hearsay, oh you know. God. That's Alex. That's hearsay. This... That's... <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny any of something. What? Um, really? I'm gonna. Well, it, There's you know, so much it all good came material. Back around. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they bought the company. It was okay. Yeah. Yeah. So come on. Yeah. It all came out in the wash. Uh, <laughs> speaking of that, I have. Do you remember our going away video that Joe Staten and I put together for you? Oh my god! In two thousand two, I I remember that evening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. You remember the evening. That's actually good. Uh, I still have. A, I'm going to send you a copy of that video uh, because I've never released it. I'm telling people about it now, but it will never be. It will never see the light of day. But uh, oh, send it to me. Yeah, it's uh, it, and frankly, if you want to release it to the public, it's okay with me. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, okay. It's, well, said we'll, it. hold, we we'll hold that. For, no, we'll it's, hold that I mean, for it's great. Special. Yeah, there is a scene in there, and I I shot all the video, and then except for the scene with, uh, I think Joe was acting as like the interviewer. You know, the whole thing is talk, it talks about Alex and his his. Uh, addictions and how he had to keep the company rolling just to pay for all of his addictions and i was talking about my cocaine dealer Vinny or something and uh it's it's all apocryphal but i have a feeling a lot of people will think it's true including a shot a, a scene where jason jones is talking about doing a bong and anybody who knows jason jason knows how far from reality that could be but we got him to say all this stuff and there's a great scene with Joe and Jason and Ed Freeze, where Ed Freeze is talking about how he bought Bungie and how how easy it was to get you guys to roll over. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's a now. classic. It's a classic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like one thing. of those. It's like one of those behind behind the music videos. <laughs> <laughs> it is exactly that was the model. Yeah. Uh, but Good yeah, times. but that was never been publicly released. It was just for that yeah. night, just for your benefit. And it was just a shame. I mean, Aaron, you should know that that Alex was 
a absolutely beloved and continues to be a beloved figure in the bungee, especially <laughs> oh, despite, my, dr- despite you know, my, I, my drug habit, huh? You know, he, <laughs> he has a he has a fan that reached out to him because of the soundtrack for Marathon. Yeah, I think I saw that. A fan. Yeah. <laughs> a, fa- a fan. A fan. No, this guy was really cool. His name's Craig. Hey. Uh, shout out to Chris. It's really easy to it's really easy to make like a ghost Twitter account and <laughs> no, we met this fan. guy. Really he, exists. <laughs> he exists. He yeah, exists. Cool. This I guy drove work. the he drove the uh he was one of the guys that would handle the uh the rover on Mars. That was like his oh, job. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. And he he used oh, to hang yeah, out with no, us at Wild. He Wide came Lug. by the office. Yeah, yeah, and he brought a bunch of Mars no, he came, rover he came swag back, and stuff. Uh, he came back no, it was uh, at, at, in Pasadena at iToys. He came over. I remember. Oh yeah, he yeah. He goes hour. back. Yeah. He's a professor yeah. in yeah. Arizona now, I think. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Anyways, that guy really... he remixed the album. The whole soundtrack. Oh, crazy. You know what? I this is this goes back a couple years, right? He was yeah. doing that? Yeah. I think yeah. I remember him uh yeah, he might have reached out to me at, at some point to s- find out if I had like some sort of source material, and I'm like, no, I don't even know who Alex the Rope is. So. <laughs> <laughs> First time I've heard the name pronounced. I didn't even know what it's <laughs> okay, that's how you say it. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Set a Yeah. All right. Okay. Marty, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We we kept yeah. you uh, we kept you over an hour, though. In all fairness, oh, you were so- like what half an hour late. <laughs> oh, here we go. We said we weren't going to say anything. You, I think oh, you sent wait, me the wrong time. What? To... Yeah. I was late. I apologize. <laughs> With all of my free time, I just I things just fritter away, and I set I set my alarms for the wrong time. I've it's it's not good. It's not good. So no, I apologize. Was, yeah, Thank you for accommodating me. Yeah. This yes, was a absolutely blast. worth the wait. Yeah. No. It was so so good. Can I ask one out. last question? One last question. It, it'll be a, you could just just say yes or no or. Okay. Like, oh yes! Oh, well, did I mean, ask the question. Paul McCartney like the bagels, and do you think that that had anything to do <laughs> with this decision? I, I to work think with? that was the key. He did have the bagel. He put lots of cream cheese on it, and we made him a, a nice pot of tea. And he he was crunching and chewing and, and enjoying yeah. it the whole time. It was like four in the afternoon, and we you know we got done by about like six. But that bagel kept him going. I think that was <laughs> the, key of the whole thing. All right. All right. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Cheers, Marty. Cheers. Bye. I'm really glad that he told us what happened to the bagels because it's one of those details where I'm like, he's like, he spent so much time talking about the bagels. And then he's like, yeah. And then we had the interview and then we, you know, we worked together for two years. And it's like, what? Did he like the freaking bagels? Uh, I I you know I saying? noticed when he was he, he was tr- clarifying at some point along there that he he accidentally referred to them as English muffins for a second. Did you did you catch that? No, I didn't catch that. And, and well, and then he huh. corrected himself. Uh, I think. Okay. I, I think that's a little. That was a little racist. I think. We're going to have to call him <laughs> you could be racist. <laughs> I've been watching London food. Speaking of London English food, uh, there is kind of like a stereotype, right? Like, oh, they don't have good food, which I. I think is one of those bad stereotypes because I've been watching um, uh, YouTube. YouTube has these these people just show like top 10 things to eat in London because uh, I'm going to be going there, you know? And I was like, I don't know what to eat, like what to do there. So I started watching these food shows and there's so many, there's like so much interesting food there, you know? And apparently the, the yeah. food of the country is tikka masala. <laughs> from what I keep saying, seeing people say, which is an Indian food. Anyways, but that was a good interview. I really enjoyed. Yeah, talking you know, to him. it uh, it made me think. Sometimes I reflect on what we do, making video games, and I think you know sometimes that we've chosen a very difficult line of work. You know, it's a very it rewarding hard. and exciting yeah. um, uh, endeavor to make a video Dude. game, but it's a combination of of technology, which is always moving, of artistry, of sound, this thing called game design, you know, just design principles in general. Yeah. And then you layer in on top of that, you know, the the um, things like uh, uh, casting and talent, you know, that, you know, for motion capture and, and voiceover and music and all that, and it gets, it can get exceptionally complicated. Yeah. And then there's people. <laughs> there's like <laughs> personalities it's like oh my goodness yes. just navigate that is hard enough you know there's a video of john carmack 
and they're like interviewing him because he started making like rocket ships or something. And uh, he he tells the interviewer, he's like, rocket science is easy. Making video games is hard. <laughs> and he explains <laughs> it. <laughs> and it is. And like his points are really true. There's so many moving parts. It's crazy. And everyone has to know what they're doing. Uh, there is the people element. Um, and, and they've only gotten harder. I remember there was a, there was a time where it would take, um, like maybe a week to do a character for a game, maybe a week, maybe less, uh, you know, that's designing it, getting it approved, getting it in the game. Like two weeks was like the average, you know, a week, two weeks. And then whenever like Epic un, un, uh, released the new version of the, um, their Unreal Editor, and they normal maps and all that stuff. Remember, it went a character turned into a month long process, you know, like getting it yeah. modeled, getting it rigged, getting it all these things. And it just keeps, and now it's even more complicated, like when you get into these uh, with face rigs and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, so t- going back to what you had originally said, talking to him made me realize um, that there is, and I kind of brought it up in the interview. Um, it didn't pick up steam, but. I wanted to talk about how I remember when I was getting into games, there, were, there there was like seasons that kind of encapsulate the entire industry. And one of them was that edgy market. Remember you'd read them, you'd be reading a magazine and every advertisement was like people's eyes popping out of their heads, <laughs> people wearing bondage gear, like whipping each other to play a game, like hands on fire because the game is so intense. And then, Halo came around and it's a little bit before Halo, actually around Halo. And it started to introduce like, like he was saying, like the cello, right? Like adding in, it, it stopped being this like sugar cereal, you know, it turned more into like bran flakes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you, you know what I'm saying? What? Like right now, <laughs> <laughs> bran flakes <laughs> taste good. They can taste good if you had uh, frosted raisins. Anyways, but do you remember? You know I, mean? I remember. So yeah. So you were talking about the 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 a, the age of in your face. Do you remember the advertising campaign for Daikatana? Yeah, like you're gonna. I remember that was. Uh, I remember that they got in trouble for it. It was like yeah. you're gonna get your. She's got. You're gonna be her, or something like you're gonna be made their bitch or something like that. John Romero is about to make you his bitch. Yeah, that's what it was. And it, thinking of it now, it actually doesn't sound that bad. I've seen so much worse since then. But that's, that sounds like, pretty bad. It I, does I, sound I, pretty bad. I, I don't know John Romero, but um, he seems like a pretty laid back, cool guy. And I think he kind of regrets that yeah. whole campaign. Um, but it was that was the time. Why? That was yeah, the time. Yeah, I don't know. I Any Okay, I don't think I would do that. It's probably not. It was the time. I think it was at the at the end of the time. You yeah. know, it was that we were about to shift into this non edgy. I guess if you if you think of uh, our industry as growing up, the, those were the shitty teenage years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yeah like the, now there's like the indie vibe, you know, yeah. and everything's indie, and everyone. I gotta say, is I, I really like that. I mean, I really like yeah. the. Games that are made uh, for the craft, you know, and that have have mm-hmm. heart to them, you know, have a soul, you know, have their have, you know, that they don't have to be works of art themselves, but things that are, mm-hmm. um, you know, bigger than just the sum of its parts. I think that's really cool, especially when done by a small team, and e- even if it's in a small scale, that, that's part of why I really like Plants vs Zombies, is it sort of has that um, that vibe to it. Yeah, like the Fez, I think Fez really you don't know if you've seen that oh yeah game or not. yeah Fez. No, I played that game Fez, really yeah. set the tone for indie games yeah the braid as well um braid also yeah those games I think had we're a ton about of to hype too that. and they did really well they did fantastic yeah. Yeah. We're, we're leaving that i what's, think we're what's about happening to leave that. are we getting too big for that mm. i think we need like a game festival circuit like a film you know like there, there's yeah. the film festival circuit where where these smaller yeah. projects can go get and find an audience and get funded. We need like a, a game festival circuit like that. There kind of is we a lot can, of that. We kind of have that. Yeah. It's yeah. There's like a bunch of them. I think the deal is though. Oh, and like uh, the guys that did super meat boy. So that was kind of the peak. And I think that those games super, they, they made a movie about it. Super meat boy, uh, Fez braid, and maybe a couple others. Oh yeah. Um, That's right. You know, around the time. I remember that. It set the tone that you can make games too if you just work hard 
and uh, you don't need like, you know, a lot of money. You just work hard and dedicate yourself. You can get it. And everybody that's been influenced by that, we're seeing the fruits of it now. And it's super saturated. Like you could go to um, Game Pass and play a lot of these games now, right? Or like Apple Arcade. There's a lot of like, it, it, there's just so much. And I think we're about to, we're about to have like a drop off of people leaving the industry and then seeing uh, some kind of new, um, new shift. Cause like web three is about to be the next big thing. Right. And what does that look like? Like, I can't even imagine what that looks like. I don't know what it is. Right. It's like, I couldn't have imagined uh, Aaron, portal. Aaron, I, I, I hate to break it to you, but I don't think anybody knows what how to define web three. I talked to a lot of folks <laughs> okay. that are investing a lot of money into this oh, space. They My all have a all different definition. Up. You know, it's, it's a, there's yeah. a, there's not one common. I, I think the promise is that everything becomes decentralized and that content that's made, like if I make something and, and I put it out, it's like still mine. It doesn't belong to that's Instagram the next or thing, Facebook probably, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Like a trading that's game. Like, that's the promise. I think that's the promise, but yeah, nobody's quite figured out what it really means yet. Yeah. But yeah, I think we're about to leave that indie vibe. There's going to be something. I think we're seeing the edge of it right now. You know, in some in some ways, though, if that's really if that if that if Web three does have that impact on distribution just in general, where you, you the the aggregators, those walled gardens of Apple and Microsoft, et cetera, become less. Uh, powerful and uh, you know individuals can distribute their own content and own it um, directly that might that might be a real boon for for independent creativity independent games maybe yeah in a good way yeah yeah and and apple yeah. will still profit from it i think they'll charge you a tax every time you trade something you know <laughs> like you pay yeah that's like because you they gotta use do. their servers they already do. yeah they already do. <laughs> But yeah, I, 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 I find myself less, less and less, uh, every indie game, like we're starting to get a lot of indie games that look the same, right? Like you can't tell which, which company did what, cause the art, the art is kind of, um, and that's not to be mean to them. It's, it's like it, they were inspired, like my art is inspired by other people. Right. And it's like comic books, right? Like you go to the comic book store, there was an era where all the comics looked like they were drawn by the same person. Um, and then there was like the indie push that brought all these other art styles and, you know, and I kind of feel like it's going to, something's going to happen and it's going to, like, I feel like Marvel Snap, I think I was telling you this, it's at the end of that, like, free to play era. Like, I don't know how, where f free to play is going to go. Um, like, everybody went free to play. It was like the MMO stuff. Remember the MMO stuff? Everybody mm -hmm. wanted to make an MMO after WoW. There was so many MMO studios. I was in Austin at the time. Almost every studio was working on an MMO. And yeah. uh, where'd that go, right? Like, I, I think mean, it's I like think Game it, Pass. What? That's what's next? I think it is. And I think that's where the indies will go. Because I like indie games, too. Are you, so you're just saying the next, so the, the next sort of um, model that's going to support the development of games is are, are these aggregation subscriptions like Game Pass yeah. or what Netflix is trying Apple to do Arcade. and exactly. what Apple Arcade I think that's is, what it is. etc. That's, that's not an unreasonable thought. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. We'll see you next yeah, time. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Fourth Curtain Podcast. To get a peek at upcoming episodes or to send in questions to the show, visit our site at thefourthcurtain.com. And be sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening.